Ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you, whether you're members of the Friends or our guests, to this presentation of the Holloman story. As this month's um, element of our lecture series, Our People, Their Stories, Oral Histories of Northern Tasmania. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and pay our respect to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community, in particular the Stony Creek Nation, as the traditional owners and continuing custodians of the land where we meet today, and to their Tasmanian Aboriginal's elders, past, present and emerging. The recent publication of the Holloman story is a very welcome addition to the historical record of our community, and who better to share with us the story of both the Hollemans and the journey to publish this fascinating book, but Robin Holliman and one of the authors, Julian Burgess. I'm not going to go into great detail because it's up to them to tell their story. Before we start, would you mind making sure that your phones are turned off? We're recording this lecture and it would be a shame to disturb <coughs> it with a, with a bell ringing. Mine's off. <laughs> and now that everybody's ready, would you join me in welcoming Robin Holliman and Julian Burgess? Thank you, Kay, and all those who are here to listen to this story. Um, I'm going to start by talking generally about Australia's uh, transport task, because Hollemans were, in part, uh, one of the leaders in that field. And transport and logistics in Australia is roughly 14.5% of GDP of Australia contributes about 100 billion into the economy. And because we have large distances and uh, low population, it, it presents different problems than might be experienced in other parts of the world. Everything in our daily life has to be associated with transport. I was trying to think of, well, what doesn't hit a truck or a road transport facility? Uh, and all I could think of was probably the vegetables made in your back garden. But then, no doubt, the seeds that you used to get those plants uh, were on the back of the truck. We also tend to not see things like the power cable under Bass Strait as transport, but that's what it is, transporting electricity. We forget things like the pipeline, gas pipelines, not only under Bass Strait, but from the uh, centre of Australia into the, where the population is to be used. And one of the uh, problems in this industry is that it's only seen as a cost to a company and as an addition to the cost of manufacturing. And therefore, there's always pressure, downward pressure on rates and an expectation, a high expectation of results. The other part of Australia's uh, general shipping is that uh, international containers, we don't see ships here in Tasmania. Uh, Melbourne's the largest port for that, and Sydney the second. But the incoming ships that are going to be in that trade, currently the largest one serving Australia, carry 8,000 containers. There's now ships being built with 24,000. The 8,000 one cannot get into Melbourne. It can't get under the Westgate uh, Bridge. It actually discharges and loads outside the port. So around Australia, in every city, to take advantage of this sort of transport uh, and to lessen our costs of uh, doing business, we would have to uh, build complete new infrastructure for ports in Australia. This sort of is, is uh, Tasmania in some ways is pretty small stuff because uh, maybe once every six months you get a ship to go across Bass Strait carrying all the freight and then you'd be complaining about 
uh, we complain now about the uh, lack of service <laughs> with the post office, but it would be a lot worse uh, if you had a larger ships. But there's three ships uh, on Bass Strait every day from Devonport to Melbourne and three leaving Melbourne six days a week. They need about 300, you know, we look at a container and uh, maybe you don't like them when you go to pass them on the road when there's three on a truck. But um, we need about a thousand containers a day to pay to keep the transport going as it is now. We see that over a hundred years in business by the Holloman family that they were a large part of the transport scene. They owned 72 ships, 64 planes when we were involved in the aviation and one of the leaders in the world in that business. And so we felt that uh, it was important that this family history as part of Australia's transport scene uh, should be written about and the history there for probably as much as anybody, uh, my grandchildren, and I have one great grandchild, I hope she's got a book, uh, but the writing of this book also uh, made it an interesting story, I hope, and we were lucky to uh, have Julian write this story for us and he certainly, in my mind, has put a lot more time into it than uh, would normally be expected from somebody who did that work. So I'm going to pass to Julian who's going to tell the story of the writing of the book. Thanks, Robin. <laughs> yes, it's... Um Today, it's hard really to comprehend the scope of the Holloman transport activities. Um, you know, over a hundred and, well, certainly well over, over a century. Um, putting the book together was particularly interesting because um, it, it was commissioned by Ivan Holloman, who is um, the great, great grandson of the company founder, William Holloman, and Robin Holloman here, who is the great grandson of William Holloman. Um, in the um, Holloman and a, a archives in Sydney that um, Ivan Holloman came across quite recently was a manuscript that had been um, completed in 1956, 57, um, on the, uh, to mark the centenary of William Holloman's arrival in Van Diemen's Land in 1854. It was written and completed um, in, a, in a leather bound folder as I understand um, and due to circumstances, um, had not been uh, published at that time. Ivan and Robin were keen that that manuscript uh, formed part of the project of the Holloman um, of Bass Strait project um, with very light editing, that it, that, it, uh, that it was published pretty much as it was written in 1956. There are a few issues there that I had to deal with. There are some things that you could say in 1956 in print that um, you probably couldn't get away with today without upsetting people, so we had to deal to deal with that. I was really happy to get involved with this project because um, I guess people of my generation, Hollemans and their associated businesses are part of our life. You know, the, the names of the ships, the planes um, and the businesses are, are all ones that we're familiar with. Um, so one of the observations that I would make to start off with is I just think it's quite remarkable that the founders of two of, of Australia's great airlines, um, the founders, uh, Victor and Ivan Holloman with a and and Hudson Fish with Qantas, all grew up in Launceston and were all educated at the Launceston Church Grammar School around the same time. Um, obviously the aviation thing didn't happen until they went off to war and learnt to fly, but uh, it's uh, pretty remarkable, I think. Um, what is interesting about the story, and, and, and we say in the book that um, Robin's father makes the observation that when you're in the transport industry, you do business with a lot of people and um, you have to understand their businesses so that you can meet their needs, uh, which gave um, the Hollemans um, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to support and invest a lot of other business out, outside of transport. And I thought the reverse is also the case, that those people who were using Holloman's um, 
services and were in touch with the, with the, with the company, understood how successful they were and I think then uh, sought their help for a number of uh, enterprises, uh, local enterprises. Um, section one of the, of the book, if you've had a look at, is largely the work of the FH uh, Johnson Publishing Company who were located at 221 George Street in Sydney in the 1950s. Um, on the staff, uh, there were a couple of well-known um, people, uh, an artist and an illustrator called Roderick uh, Shaw uh, and a Tasmanian-born journalist called Clive Turnbull. Um, Roderick Shaw was born in 1915, died in 1992, um, and his online bio says that he was a communist and that he painted a Soviet-style mural on the side of the Waterside Workers' Union building in Sydney. Now, I'm not sure whether Sir Ivan Holloman uh, was aware of that um, or Keith uh, was aware of it, but um, given the problems in the shipping industry, <laughs> if they found out, they mightn't have been too happy. Um, they were never happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the book, the, the centenary book was commissioned by, uh, by Sir Ivan in the, in the early 1950s. Um, and um, the manuscript, as I said, was completed. Um, but the death of Sir Ivan and the collapse of ANA meant that it was never published. Um, Frank Johnson employed a chap called uh, Charles Ramsey from Devonport to look into the Tasmanian aspect of the, of the Holloman family. Um, Charles Ramsey was a, a mariner um, and a historian um, and the original title of the book was um, Footsteps in the Sea, which I thought was a bit unusual, um, followed by the Holloman story and it, the manuscript is generally now... I thought we walked on water. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I didn't think about that. It seemed to be trimmed down to the Holloman story. Um, uh, Frank Johnson was an interesting person. He was uh, born, in uh, born in Victoria, um, was educated at the Brighton Technical School and he worked as a commercial artist in Melbourne before going to London where he dabbled in journalism, uh, advertising and worked for a press agency. When he came back to Australia, um, he worked as a commercial artist and um, uh, quite a good one by all accounts. Uh, he registered his, and he's a very good photographer, uh, um, his collection of about 23,000 photos um, following his death were, death were um, acquired by the National Library of Australia. Uh, he founded his publishing company in 1944 and Ivan Holloman would have been one of his, um, his earliest clients. Um, among the books, that he, he, book, he published books on war, aviation, travel and the pastoral industry. Um, and he also edited a number of magazines, some of which the names uh, are familiar to me. Um, or not, this, not this one, the Australasian Book, News and Library Journal, sounds like a good, Air Traveller, Wings I remember as a publication some years ago and, and Qantas Airways. Um, he, uh, he, in 1945 he was approached by um, Sir Ivan to write a history of the aviation side of the um, Holloman business called Wings of Tomorrow. Um, it's not a big book, 68 pages um, and it seems to have been a limited print run, I know Robin's got a copy of it and it's, um, it comes up. Um, when you Google it. Um, it was written by a fellow called Clive Turnbull um, and he was born in um, Hobart in 1906 and um, in Hobart and uh, joined the Mercury as a reporter in 1922 and then moved to Melbourne where he worked on the Herald. Um, interestingly, he wrote a book in, uh, in the 1940s called The Black War, uh, the story of the extermination of Indigenous Tasmanians. And I, somehow I thought that people writing about that was quite a contemporary thing, but obviously people were writing it about it years and years ago. Um, doesn't that, one of the interesting things about the Holloman story manuscript is that there's no mention of who wrote it, uh, other than that uh, Frank Johnson published it. So whether um, uh, Clive Turnbull was involved or not, it's very hard to say. Uh, there's not much um, material left from the early Holloman days. And it, and it says in, the, uh, in that book that um, nearly all William Holloman Sr's personal papers were burnt by a relative of his second wife, um, <laughs> which is a bit sad, really. Uh, as I said, much of the research for it was done by um, Charles Ramsey, um, and um, he, was, uh, he uh, served before the mast as a, as a, uh, as a mariner, and um, he, um, I think, perhaps wrote some of the... Um, the recreating of the, uh, of the of the of the of the voyage um, that William Holloman undertook in 1854 uh, to get to Van Diemen's Land. 
Um, interesting, Charles uh, Ramsey's book, um, With the Pioneers, a uh, history of uh, white settlement on the northwest coast, is into its fourth uh, printing. It was published in 1940, um, 1957, and it's still in print, still being printed, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and it's written in a bit of a colourful style, the first part of the book, which I think is good and um, reflects on the, on the, on the time. Um, the material that I was able to uh, call upon uh, was uh, Robin's extensive um, accumulation of Holloman material, company records, um, other publications. Um, there were regular features in the, uh, in the Examiner and uh, a very good article in the Port of Melbourne Quarterly News in 1970 and, um, and lots of other stuff. And one of the, uh, the other resources of, is a book that was written in, um, in t well, published in 2001 by a fellow called Peter Yule called The Forgotten Giant of Australian Aviation, which was about a and and Sir Ivan Holloman. And um, that touches on the, uh, only touches lightly on the uh, maritime aspects of the, uh, of the Holloman story. I think that's pretty much the writing that was pretty straightforward um, and um, you know, putting it together obviously was, uh, was a lot of fun and the photos, Ivan um, Holloman had been collecting ship photos, I think he said it as his life's goal to get, a photo, uh, get a, an image of every um, Holloman ship, unfortunately photography really only came into vogue you know, in the latter half of the uh, 19th century so there are drawings and, as well as, um, um, as, well as um, photos and paintings and so forth, but we managed to get quite a few of them into the book. And um, yes, I think that aspect. Well, of I think pretty we good. missed about ten. Ten. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'll hand back to Robin now, and uh, yeah. he can tell his side of the, f the family story. Yeah. Well, William Martin, uh, William Holloman was born in Barton upon Humber, which is a little village opposite Hull, and. Uh, I, and he was born in 1833. In 1838, his father, who was a fisherman, was drowned in a fishing accident, as does happen. He and his brother, uh, his ma mother married again, had another son, there were three boys, and they all, uh, with the help of their stepfather's friend, were admitted to the Trinity House uh, the people that run the lighthouses and so on, Trinity uh, House Navigation School. When he was 15, he left there. He had about three years uh, there. He went to sea. And uh, he had quite a lot of, uh, let us say, in that international uh, shipping experience. And in his Bible, he wrote uh, later on in life, I left Hull by steam, 1852, for London, made a trip to Odessa and back to London, run, ran away, which he was low, uh, seemed happy to do, and joined the Galteris, a brig for Colombo and Madras. He obviously jumped ship again in London and found his way to Liverpool, uh, where he joined a ship called the Elizabeth Radcliffe, that was coming to Launceston uh, carrying 3,585 pieces of cargo. It was a 220 tonne ship. There were 32 iron houses, six iron shops, six iron stores, lots of soap, 600 bottles of soap, 12 crates of earthenware, 32 packages of glass, 200 uh, cases of soap. Must have been a dirty colony. <laughs> they were all going, uh, the, the agent was uh, a firm called Hobkirk, and some of the soap was for that company. It, it, stating that uh, gives you some idea of the type of freight that these ships were carrying. The shipping, in fact, carried... Um, convicts previously, had a couple of trips, I think, uh, with convicts, and uh, 
It arrived at the Tamer Heads on the 1st of June 1854. For some reason, uh, the river's not that long, but it took 11 days to get to Launceston. <laughs> Must have been a southern the... <laughs> Fog or something. Uh, mm. On the way out, the crew had been very badly treated and um, ill-fed, we believe. Some of this, of course, is a bit hard to find out, but um, quite a few of the crew refused to work and for insubordination, they were put on a treadmill for three weeks. And they were taken back to the ship when it was leaving. The ship was in the river quite a long time before it left, and of course sailing ships needed the tide and the wind, and you had to wait for it. And uh, while waiting, William Holloman and another uh, chap jumped ship. Now, I don't know whether they walked ashore or... It'd be <laughs> doubtful if they could swim, but they did go ashore. And he made his way down to Devonport. And No, sorry, before that, he uh, had three months on the treadmill for desertion, because when you sign articles on a ship, you're supposed to stick with them. Uh, he made his way down to Devonport, uh, married... a. An 18, 18 and a half year old girl that had uh, arrived in uh, Tasmania not long after him. And it was interesting uh, education facilities in those days, but uh, she did sign the marriage certificate with an ex. He, uh, they had children, four children. Thomas was the eldest. And didn't, he did not have any children. William II had 13 children. <laughs> Susanna had eight. And my grandfather, James, had 11. So between them, they had 32 children. And if anybody says, hey, you're related, I have to say <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so William got what work he could get. Uh, he would work on ships, ships going across Bass Strait, whatever it was, to feed his family. And as the, his uh, sons reached the age of 12, they were put on a ship and sent to sea. Interestingly, Thomas, the eldest, who didn't have any children, was the only one who had a foreign-going master's ticket. And his brothers, William and James, had what we used to refer to as mud pickets. But when the regulations changed and you had to be, have the right ticket, they gave them to William and James because they'd been captain of these ships for so long. Susanna uh, married Harry Woods, which, who was the shipbuilder... <coughs> pardon me. Uh, the shipbuilder in Devonport, and uh, the slipways are still there when you go over the bridge uh, into Devonport on the western side, just under the bridge, um, well, not right under the bridge, alongside the bridge is uh, where uh, Harry Wood made ships uh, for Hollemans, and particularly their first steamship he made in 1890. Tom, Thomas was uh, known as Roaring Tom and had, uh, he probably wrecked more ships than his brothers. Uh, always seemed something was happening. Uh, one of his interesting trips, um, he had a new ship and he went to Melbourne to pick it up. There were three on board and uh, when they left the heads uh, at Melbourne, Queenscliff, they... Uh, had a fire. They could virtually see the shore, but um, they got the lifeboat out, not much in it. They had a couple of blankets, I think, put up a jury rig to try and... They couldn't get back to Victoria, so they de Tom decided that he would sail across to Tasmania. It took them two or three days. 
uh, one of them died eventually uh, after the event, not long after, and two survived. And they always said that it was Thomas's skill that got them there. The Holloman brothers were quite interesting in, you can imagine those size families because A, you didn't need to employ anybody, you had enough in the family. And a lot of them did go either as uh, skippers of their ships or um, you know, a lot were engineers. Um, and um, I suppose that the company developed because of the numbers and the number of jobs required. You bought another ship and you put somebody on it. Uh, I've tried to uh, include in my talk some things that are not necessarily in the book or may not come to you. But things like when the company developed, we forget that there was no road, there was uh, no railway line, there were no cars, and so there were about 40 ports across uh, northern Tasmania where you either had a jetty, some of the little, they went into the Don, uh, Port Sorel, uh, La Trobe, up into the village of La Trobe. Uh, of course, the other major ports were serviced, Burnie, Devonport, and lots in between. And uh, these little ships, would carry a few potatoes or they might only carry 10 tonnes of freight. Um, and then, of course, the railways came in about 1872 and uh, William and his sons could see that the business would go to the railways, which it did. So they looked for further work. Um, where, where do you find trade? Uh, there was King Island, of course, Flinders Island, and uh, they entered into Bass Strait and into Melbourne. They, because of this, in the early 1900s, there was a uh, bit of a war for freight on Bass Strait, and um, the company came to an arrangement with Union Steamship Company to uh, be a silent partner in the company. Uh, which went on till the company didn't trade anymore. Uh, and that was in 1904. In 19... It, it, it's interesting to get out of the transport side for a minute because they invested in... Uh, I suppose if you're at sea and you see nothing but water, seamen are sometimes very uh, loved to buy land they want to be on farms and land. So in 1907, Holloman Brothers, which was a company formed between James and his brother William, bought Waterhouse Island and, of course, owning ships and the transport facility uh, was a big advantage when you owned Ireland. Their first uh, venture into... Uh, Road movement was in 1911. They purchased a bus. I don't know whether I'd want to be on it, but to run to Beauty Point. I think it had solid uh, tyres. Uh, in 1916, they uh, bought Robins Island. Uh, and later on, uh, in 1926, the lease of Trefoil Island. Uh, Robins Island is still in Holloman uh, family. Uh, my sister and husband bought the island from the family in uh, 1957, eight, I think. Uh, there's about 10,000 hectares on the island and they were one of the first in Australia to um, breed Wagyu. They imported some uh, Wagyu via America into Australia. 1919, William Holloman dies. 
1924 or before, some of these dates are a bit hard to find out when they occurred. Northern Motors, uh, which was in latter times in uh, George Street, uh, sold Packards, Chrysler's, Austin's, Wolseley's. Uh, then they, some years later, um, sold Borgwartz, the German manufacturer that went to bankrupt. Uh, and uh, the company was the first in Australia to sign up to distribution for uh, Nissan. At that time it was the Pulsar. But, uh, so we bought Warwick Motors in Hobart and uh, so we had distribution and retail of those cars. 1932, they, um, yeah, this was a major purchase. They bought 50% share of Katie Atkins, who was a sawmiller down at King's Wharf. Uh, and later that company was uh, listed as Kiln Dried Hardwoods Limited and became probably the largest uh, timber company in Tasmania. That company joined with guns in the latter years. 1938, the Flinders Island Fishing Company went broke and uh, owed, owing money to um, William Holloman and Sons for freight and to uh, Jay Gadsden, the can manufacturer in Melbourne for cans, the two decided that they would uh, take over the fishing company and run it. Uh, and I think my father, uh, in fact, uh, ran it in the end. But they were, uh, Julian didn't mention, but he, he seemed, did a bit of research and was quite interested in um, the war effort. Would you yes. make it? Yes, I, um, I think you mentioned the other day that both the planes and ships were um, pressed into national service, as it were. Um, and the um, so was the canning factory, and and so was the canning factory. And during the uh, during the war, they produced over um, the Second World War two million cans of fish for um, the Burma campaign, um, uh, white bait for hospitals, and squab, which is tinned mutton bird in aspic, um, for <laughs> army and navy canteens. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, um, and they also uh, they, and uh, they also produced um, canned food for the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation um, Services um, um, uh, after the war, which um, was a you know, pretty uh, significant contribution to the to the war efforts. But the ships were taken over for moving essential supplies, and the planes quite a few of the planes were repainted into RAAF colours and. Um, uh, ANA personnel uh, flew them into into war zones. Just going back to the the, the fish, it, it's interesting for those who might know a little bit about fishing. Uh, um, tuna, they didn't know how to can tuna in Australia at that time, uh, so it was um, barracuda that was put into cans. And uh, as Julian says, they put. Uh, well, they chicken of the sea was what they called, <laughs> called the mutton, mutton bird. bird. Yeah. And at one stage, they actually uh, they bought in, uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, at the time they bought Pacific oysters, and the first Pacific oysters in Australia joined up with those in the Tamar River, which we can see uh, very visibly today. When uh, Keith was uh, managing director of fish canneries of Tasmania, they were operating 20, uh, 20 fishing boats around the coast and there were um, factories in, on Lady Barron in Launceston, in Dunalley, Margate, um, Bridport um, and a receiving plant at Georgetown. So it was a pretty big um, operation. They did sell uh, mutton birds, uh, which I can assume they caught on Robins Island because there are rookeries there. Um, and they were also selling um, kangaroo skins uh, into the UK market. 
I think it was a complete failure from the reports that I could read about that uh, they didn't sell that well. In 1932, one of the, again, the major investments they made and developed was the uh, purchase of Laurie Johnson's TES aerial service in the Miss Flinders. Uh, I think the first air mail out of Australia went uh, across Bass Strait on that. And they, the company developed. In 1934, it became Holloman Airways. 1935, ANA put together, uh, sorry, ANA was formed, it was put together by shipping companies, Holloman Airways, Adelaide Steamship Airways, Haddard Parker, Union Company, and Orient Steam Navigation. And I thought you might be interested in this development. Uh, they considered that the uh, ANA had the longest scheduled route miles of any company in the world. And this is show, shows you how simple things can be um, developed because in those days airlines were new. And this is an extract from the book called Beyond Line Rock in the story of Cathay Pacific Airlines. Passenger traffic was a source of revenue for the shipping industry. So the threat of losing passengers to airlines meant that maritime companies became involved in airlines. But the Swire Group in Hong Kong said, we must protect the air over our ships. <laughs> and this didn't happen only in Hong Kong or overseas. If you want to travel from Melbourne to Sydney in the past, before people wouldn't get on planes, in fact, they got on them across Bass Strait because it was water and convenient. But most of the passengers uh, in Australia went by sea, usually in um, cargo ships, had, had cargo. And all the Holloman ships um, that are probably flashing up on the screen, most of them, the early ones, carried passengers. Um, so on this book it says, uh, with Cathay Pacific, and they want to pre protect their passengers, R.W. Morton from, from CNCOs, that's the shipping company's agent, Collier Watson of Australia was visiting Hong Kong, and Holloman was Ivan Holloman, managing director of a and They had asked, who do we get information when we want to start an airline? Who do we get information from? and they were told Holloman of Australia. And that was Ivan. Ivan and the Swire people were excited about the air service to Hong Kong, on which Ivan had set his heart. Despite strong opposition from Ben Chipley, who didn't like private airlines. Holloman's helped set up Cathay Pacific and were given a 30% share but in the end, government obstruction defeated private enthusiasm, despite Ivan's fighting qualities and Jock Squire's support for an independent Hong Kong link was not to be. Thanks to the Australian government's opposition and the contention of the British Ministry of Civil Aviation and the government subsidised VOAC. In other words, Hong Kong is for British, not those colonial Australians. Uh, so the next uh, thing that was invested, they also invested uh, and they had a 50% share in Air Salon. Uh, which also, I think, in the end was uh, scuppered in some way. The other part of that was uh, they thought that uh, they should get into hotels. And in 1947, I think under my father's signature, they bought Rest Point with an idea that ANA 
formed a company called Australian National Hotels in that they would have a series of hotels throughout Australia. Uh, they owned it, reconditioned, built some more down there. Some of it's still standing. Um, and so they played quite a big part in that part of Tasmania's history. And it was sold in 1957 when the airline was sold. I'm not too sure. I think it was sold for um, paper in the form of shares to federal hotels because uh, I know... Um, James Holloman, Proprietary Limited, uh, was selling the shares off over, over time to recoup their capital. Uh, it's a pretty topical at the moment. I, I must say, uh, in my time, I was always in a superannuation fund. And in 1941, before many people had heard of superannuation, Holloman's uh, devised a scheme uh, with AMP it was done. 44, my grandfather dies. And uh, 1945, uh, on Robins Island, they built a cheese factory. And uh, they thought the best way to go with Robins Island, uh, a cheese is easier to transport than fresh milk. But they advertised, they split it into um, three dairy farms uh, and advertised they wanted Dutch uh, immigrants with lots of children because uh, if you had ten young children, the government would supply a teacher. <coughs> so they built a school. It's still there on the island. So they built a school and... Uh, uh, Mr McQuestion was one of the uh, teachers there years ago. Uh, in 1947, a, um, some of these things are, we don't know which company invested them or how much. 1947, they took a 25% in investment in Gebbies, which were electrical retailers in uh, Charles Street. It seems a funny investment. And I don't know why. It's not uh, listed anywhere. 1953, they sold Waterhouse Island. <coughs> and, of course, in 56, the airline... After the war, the uh, federal Labor government uh, didn't like banks, didn't like airlines, didn't like ships. And uh, they formed the Commonwealth Bank, the uh, Australian National Line for ships, and TAA for the airlines. And, of course, as soon as they did that, the instruction was all government business must go through TAA and um, air mail included. Mm -hmm. So the family lost... Uh, the company, a and lost uh, a lot of their business. And basically, you could say that um, the, the future was dim from that time on. So Ivan Holloman was in uh, America. The, the airline were running on charter, I imagine, to BOAC. After the war, they were running to London, running to America, flying planes to those places. Uh, they ran into trouble with uh, the Australian government um, with... You, you might like to comment on... Uh, they couldn't get the pressurised planes. Uh, they wanted to buy American pressurised planes. And, of course, you had to go to the government to get the funds in American dollars, and uh, they were stopped. So they had to import planes that were not necessarily... Um, suitable. Up, yeah, mm. suitable. The, the, theory, the, the, the theory, the industry theory, was that the British made good fighting planes and the Americans made good um, transport passenger planes. I mean, the, the, you can go to another extreme that uh, during that period of uh, planes flying across the Pacific, um, the British felt that all the air space was theirs and didn't want America, and they stopped American planes. You could not fly from America 
to Australia at that time, you had to fly to New Zealand, New Caledonia and back to Australia in some form. Uh, and I think the uh, landing rights through the Pacific Islands was also another problem in um, uh, American Samoa is that because you needed to land somewhere and the British wouldn't let them land on their land, of course. And H Harold Gaddy got round that by becoming a sort of a de facto American. Yes. For his air, uh, Pacific oh, well, Airways. Well, he left uh, Campbelltown when he was two. Yes. Okay. But he, we still claim him as... Yeah, of course. Uh, so the airline was uh, in a lot of trouble. Um, I don't have many records, but obviously it was losing money in 1956 and um, was sold to Ansett. I know that out of the five companies involved, the Holloman family were concerned that um, Reg Ansett didn't have any money. Uh, he was a much smaller company and uh, to enable him to buy the company, he borrowed the money from Shell and the vacuum oil company. Um, there was an interest, and again, I don't know the extent. Um, I think Julian's done a bit of homework on this, but they did have a um, 57 or prior, uh, did have an investment in the Alexander Racker factory. Uh, the building's, of course, there and has been put to good use. Yes. Any other comment? No, well, only that uh, um, I, I expect that uh, your father was asked to go on the board to help them as they went through the, uh, a very difficult period and uh, with, I think it was Gordon Hughes, uh, who was a friend, was the, the chairman for a period, so it uh, wasn't a successful rescue effort in the end. Um, there's also some, I know my father was a director of Dew Crisps, so into the vegetable business. I have absolutely no record of what company owned the shares, uh, whether it was the individual family companies or Holloman Brothers. Um, and you checked that out but couldn't find anything? No, yeah. only that um, at one stage there, were, there, were, um, there was pressure for the Bridport um, airstrip to be upgraded to take an um, ANA plane to carry, uh, and they, they actually did that. And uh, some of the, um, the dried vegetables and so forth actually flown to Melbourne. There was a special presentation of the, mayor, the Lord Mayor of, of Melbourne, apparently, of, of Duke crisp uh, vegetables flown direct from Bridport to, to Melbourne, which is a bit interesting. Yeah. You wonder how they ever got into some of this stuff. Yes. Uh, in 1959, James Holloman invested in an uh, Australia-wide... Um, rug and carpet importer uh, and distributor uh, called E.R. Sharma. It was an unlisted uh, public company um, and operated and had branches in every state in Australia. Uh, there was another little electro company evidently formed out of a Gibby contact um, in 1961, the William II's family company joined with Mons and Affleck to form Holloman Mons Affleck, and uh, <coughs> later known as HMA, was a listed company. This takes me to uh, the couple of missing years there because uh, I don't have a record, but I started work in. Uh, 1959, uh, my father wanted me to do something further in life uh, than after school before going into the business. So uh, I went to Longanong Agriculture College, which is just outside Horsham, and had three years learning, uh, hopefully learning about agriculture. Probably many other things too at those places. <coughs> In 59, we ran a ship from King's Wharf to Melbourne. We had a ship called the Lamana running from the northwest coast to Melbourne. 
and they were doing a weekly service with uh, what we would term break bulk. Um, virtually stuffing, where you stuff con cartons in containers now, you put them all in the one hold of the ship. There were limited containers, and particularly we had a, an express freight service that used uh, small containers. These were conventional ships lifting three tonnes. At that time, uh, around about 1960, uh, some of you will remember the Princess of Tasmania came on the run, the first of the new passenger ferries uh, with the, that took freight, roll on, roll off, which was new to Tasmania. And um, the Bass Trader came on shortly after. Uh, we had ordered a vessel from the state dockyard in uh, Newcastle to build us a ship called the William Holloman. It was decided by the board that the trade wasn't big enough for another roll on vessel and the trade might have been over serviced. So they built a, uh, a lift on lift off 14 tonne crane ship. As soon as that was announced, uh, our opposition, the national line, the government line, converted one of their ships to North Esk and put some cranes on that to uh, show us that they're in business. Uh, by 1962, the Lamana was tied up. So a ship built in 56. Six years is not very long mm. um, for the life of a ship. As it was tied up in Melbourne, and I was working in Melbourne, and uh, Anne and I were married at that stage, uh, and, well, long after nine months, but we did have a, a son at that stage. <laughs> uh, Anne was asked would she be watchwoman on the Lamana, <laughs> tied up to 19 South Wharf in the middle of Melbourne. Uh, so we had nearly a year there and we were glad we went back to sea because uh, our son Thomas was uh, about to walk and that may have been a problem. <laughs> there were a few stories there, let me tell you. Uh, running a ship to Launceston and you know, this is uh, other things than just trying to make money. Uh, we had, with four cranes, four lots of men needed to <coughs> hook on the containers. We needed, on foggy days, we mightn't get to Launceston. If the tide wasn't right, we didn't get to Launceston. And King's Wharf, uh, would not take the containers of the ability that we could lift. So we had to make, and you'll see in some of these photos, uh, the William Holloman lifting containers that we had to make especially. And the way we got over the forklift problem was we used straddle trucks and Northern Motors had imported straddle trucks from being involved in the timber industry, they had imported straddle trucks for the timber industry and many of you will remember the, the driver up top and with timber underneath delivering down to the wharf. So it was uh, not the easiest of times for us to uh, be competing with others. Um, we did get the uh, Jack Edwards, we got Jack Edwards to, and the uh, Port Authority to move the crane that you can still see on the wharf at King's Wharf that was put there for us. Uh, one of the problems with the crane ship is if four of them went over the wharf together, the ship was, <laughs> might roll over. Uh, so lifting from the shore is much better and uh, Jack uh, made a ramp, uh, strengthen some uh, wharf there alongside that would take a large forklift and we were able. And we found at that time too, uh, this leads into 
quite a lot of uh, road transport develop, development that happened. Well, we'd owned trucks for years, but we could see as Bass Strait shipping changed into roll on, roll off, we also needed to change our outlook for our customers and go more door to door and collect their own freight. We were uh, more up against um, the other transport companies like TNT, FH Stevens, Frank Hammond, and those type of companies that picked your freight up, containerised them, took them to the wharf. And we could see that we wouldn't uh, achieve freight unless we did the same thing. So that was uh, one of my jobs, to go around Melbourne knocking on doors and seeing what we could get. Uh, we did other transport work in, in the late uh, 1960s, 68 or 9, uh, with our connection with the union company, we were asked when they were putting roll-on, roll-off ferries, no, not ferries, ships, cargo ships to um, New Zealand. Uh, they provided all the container equipment except refrigerators. We had refrigerated containers and we were asked would we get involved in that trade and we did in quite a big way. We were one of the biggest. We had to go to Sydney. Uh, we bought property there. We sent some trucks and forklifts and uh, with subcontractors we um, had a company, a transport company running there. Uh, over time we, we then had to put people into New Zealand. We had five branches in New Zealand and uh, in the end we were carrying, we were one of the biggest forwarders out of Sydney and we were carrying 50% uh, of the refrigerated freight between New Zealand and Australia. Those are things that don't sort of show up in Tasmania because uh, ships were also going from uh, Brisbane into New Zealand and some of them at that time I think were still coming to Tasmania from Brisbane. Uh, we set up a branch there uh, and in 1970 with the uh, Mary Holloman being built, a roll on roll off ship to run from Adelaide to well, South Australia into Tasmania. Um, we set a, a depot up in Adelaide that became quite a large establishment, sent a few trucks and put our manager in there and we found we really had to collect our own freight, uh, package it and, and put it on the ship. Um, one of the photos that come up and interesting, and I thought some of the freight casts are interesting, wasn't on planes. Um, the, uh, the bushfires in uh, eastern South Australia and western Victoria in the pine forest, uh, the forestry people said, if, if we place those forests, those trees that have been burnt, pine forests, in water, they can be salvaged and be harvested. So uh, we were asked, uh, the Tasmanian logging people, uh, tree fallers and so on, uh, we were asked, because the, the Mary Holloman had its own ramp, we could go into Portland, so we did... Uh, a load and you'll see all the logging equipment arriving there and going on that ship to Portland and then we some months later went back and picked it up so we were part hopefully of saving those uh, those trees. We also from uh, BHP, uh, BHP owned their own ships, I don't know whether they still do but uh, they always bought their iron made in Wyala to direct to Tasmania uh, and when the Mary Holloman came because we were under uh, an obligation to the Australian government to build an Australian replacement as she had been built up in Holland 
uh, I, they had a shipyard there and certainly uh, wanted to build any ship that we might uh, build in Australia, gave us the freight. And this, they were interesting because they were the big I-beams, some would be up to 60 feet long, which presents you know, <coughs> handling uh, problems both on the ship. And, uh, you, you need extendable trailers, so you go out and buy some of those. It uh, goes on and on. Uh, they, South Australia and Tasmanian railways were the only ones not privatised and were left with the Commonwealth. So when they pulled up the Unidata track uh, line, uh, we got, Tasmania got the uh, second hand rail to upgrade the rail line here and we bought lots of containers of um, sleepers and uh, probably thousands of tonnes of railway iron. The other uh, interesting job we did, we um, brought fly ash from uh, the precipitators in the Port Augusta power station, which just has been completely demolished and is gone. Uh, it produced 50% of uh, South Australia's power and we took that to the Gordon Dam because the hydro was trialling, uh, it's, we hear a lot about carbon, but uh, fly ash is carbon and it's used uh, in the mix of concrete in continuous pours because you need to uh, disperse the heat when uh, it um, cures. Cures, thank you. Um, <coughs> There was another interesting, um, are we out of time? Just about. Is everybody happy if I just tell a couple more stories? This one's interesting because it had nothing to do with Holloman's other than I had a very good friend in Adelaide who uh, made epoxies and the, the continuous pour dams in all the concrete dams in Tasmania prior to the Gordon, are, are when they uh, pour them, they cool them with, um, it was always with copper pipes. So the whole thing is in the middle of those dams is copper pipes. So you can pump water through it, you're pumping water through to cool it. Well they decided, uh, they found in America, all the cooling was done with um, aluminium pipes. So the Gordon Dam was started with aluminium and you've got to think there's no stopping and there's got, you've got to think you, you don't want to crack otherwise you've got a lot of work to start again. <coughs> and they found that when they were about a third of the way up that they filled, always filled the copper pipes with uh, slurry, cement slurry. They found that the aluminium reacted with the um, cement, Tasmanian cement, and produced hydrogen. <laughs> so in fact you had a, a gas hydrogen bomb in the <coughs> middle of the day. So my friend and I went down because they were looking for some inert product that could be pumped down the aluminium pipes uh, not leave holes, so it couldn't set <coughs> halfway. Um, he didn't get the contract, but I had a e very ex interesting experience going down the, the front of that dam. We did a lot of uh, bulk out of South Australia. We carried uh, gypsum for the cement industry in Ralton, and we carried salt um, to uh, Burnie for the paper mill and to Hobart for the newsprint mill. Uh, these were usually just poured into the ship in the old days, but with the Mary Holloman we had to containerise it, which meant we had to build containers that suited it. We had to build um, tipping trucks that were, we see them now, we see the wheat, uh, that'll hold you up at Mons and Affleck every now and again. Uh, but all that had to be uh, worked on design uh, to suit the trade. Um, 
I think that's probably enough, mm. unless you've got something to add. No, no, I think you've covered it pretty well. I could do more, but I don't think... <laughs> but I think people would be asleep. Yes, uh, that one's nodded off yet, but... Uh... Anyway, if, uh, would you like questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah we probably prefer questions. I could, uh, in fact, in my satchel there, two other uh, people in Victoria, University of Melbourne, um, have virtually written a book about every ship that Holloman owned and every plane they owned. And uh, I think they intend to publish it. But I could go through, I can't answer your question because a lot of them, there were, I, I had a list, uh, 10 uh, were wrecked. Um, uh, there's probably examples all around Tasmania coast somewhere. The one that Tom had was obviously burnt. Um, but there are records. The records for shipping are, are amazing. If you have the order number, you can find it. Who built it, who owned it, and uh, ships, uh, this is an aside from what you say, but it's sold in 64ths. You can have own one 64th of a ship, or 64ths of a ship if you own all of it. So you see a lot of the information is uh, vessels, somebody buying 15, 64ths or whatever. But, th but there are very excellent records and, and it would be very easy. And again, you'd probably be here too long if I went and got all the records and told you what ha happened to each ship. But uh, a few wrecked. Uh, the William Holloman ended up, uh, there were three or four of them in my time that uh, went to the Maldives. The Maldives were buying up all the old ships around the world uh, <coughs> and uh, they didn't, I think it was there before the big tourism, it was their biggest industry was ships and they ran all around the Indian coast and the Indian Ocean. Um, and the William Holloman ended up, um, she was somewhere and was bombed. Um, she ended up in some war effort somewhere. Uh, the Mary Holloman was somewhere in the Mediterranean. I don't imagine she's still sailing, it could be. The history of the company seems to be uh, characterised by some people of extraordinary vision who saw amazing opportunities and uh, reacted and adapted very quickly to make the most of them. How is the Holliman Company contemporary now and what are its holdings and its interests and what are your opportunities um, and vision for future companies or ventures in Tasmania? Uh, that, that in some ways, uh, pretty easy to ask. Because of answer, because um, that original, and I made sure it was in my talk, that the original um, connection with Union Company, there was also another one with Hudded Parker. It was always run by the family, uh, and. Uh, controlled by the family um, and you can say they were investors uh, they always felt the Hollemans could always beat them in the market and would rather be part of them than opposing them uh, that interest um, and it becomes very complicated into the future because I think T&T, the transport company, had a, a, an interest in um, a company called Bulk Ships. It later became T&T Bulk Ships. And that gave T&T a 2.5% interest in the company. 
and if you like, that was the start of the end because when TNT um, got involved, 2.5% was like having 100%. And we started to become uh, directed by them more than anything. So uh, it wasn't very nice for my father and I to appear before them when they said, Keith, you either get out now, we'll buy you out, or there'll be nothing left. So that in, happened in the 1957, they owned the company. Uh, as part of bulk ships. I kept working uh, and we were running it. Uh, no, the ship finished by uh, then. But they did form when TNT was sold, which was quite interesting, that TNT bulk ships, as part of the group, um, and it was complicated in some ways because when the union, TNT wanted to buy the union company, the New Zealand government blocked it, financed the various transport companies into having enough money to buy half of it, and TNT had the other half. Uh, you've got to remember too that TNT owned half of uh, ANA, uh, ANSET. Um, so when TNT was sold, uh, TNT bulk ships, which owned um, they had a couple of uh, the only refined sugar ships in the world. Um, they had the two of the coal burning uh, bauxite carriers uh, up in, from Weeper to Gladstone. Uh, they owned the pipeline, uh, the Cooper Basin pipeline. Uh, they owned whatever was left of Holloman's. Um, they owned the Goliath. They owned the ship that uh, ran the alumina from uh, New Zealand into Bell Bay and Gladstone. Um, and that company was listed in an IPO as Holloman Limited, as a public company, uh, which um, unfortunately for that company that had good assets, bought five of Bob Clifford's catamarans that broke them. So uh, that's probably another story, but uh, you know, not always new technology yeah. pays. Yes, yeah, sure. No, 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 no. I knew Stevens well, and I uh, had some fights and wars with them over the time because they were very much in Tasmania, our, our opposition. Uh, a very nice family and had done well, but that was a time uh, when transport in Australia really, say, uh, interstate transport was uh, pretty new until after the war. Was it, you know, it was a new thing. So a lot of Stephen's work with, they had the contract for AWPM. Uh, they'd pick up the containers, loaded at the uh, AWPM Burnie factory and cart it to the wharf. Yeah, no, F.H. Stevens, uh, in the end, it, it, they were taken over by Main Nicholas. Mm. And uh, later on, we employed on the William Holloman, uh, the mate on the William Holloman uh, was a, a chap named Peter Rosethorn, whose brother was the uh, actor. And uh, Peter's uh, uh, stepfather was the largest individual shareholder in May Nicholas. And so Peter, in the end, left us and uh, worked for May Nicholas, was on the board, and it was he, he and um, Paul, Little. Paul Little that set up Toll. So that that's another connection with F.H. Stevens. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Well, I, th I think when I started work uh, in 59, there was still one horse and cart working at Kingswall. <laughs> well, I think we might have to draw this to a close now. Robin and Julian, thank you very much for such a, an entertaining and informative afternoon. You both have a talent for storytelling. I love these presentations, despite how much we think we know about these stories. New details and surprises seem to be revealed, and you could see that today as, every, as the responses in the audience rippled around, around on a regular basis. Your story is, is um, well, no, what a family is what I want to say. It seems to me that your achievements and your actions have affected us all, and it's been quite sobering, I think, for all of us to reflect how many times that your activities will have affected our lives. Your story is, it's clear, deserves to be shared with, with as many people as possible, far and wide. So thank you for spending your time and effort to prepare your talk for us today. For those of you who'd like to explore the story a little further, the book, The Holyman Story, is available in the shop. And for those of you who are members of the Friends, you're entitled to a 10% discount. So I encourage you to uh, buy something for a Christmas stocking. So would I, um, in closing, I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking Robin and Jack. You didn't get to say much. No, that's good. Before we leave, I'd just like to mention, if you enjoyed this afternoon's presentations, our next Our People, Their Stories will take place on the Wednesday, the 24th of November, when our speaker will be Michael Edgar, the, ad, the actor. Um, we hope to see some of you there soon.